great to be here today, and uh, I wanted to just say that Hal has taken a lead uh, in the profession of getting a lot of information out, and I want to thank you, Hal, for, I truly do, for, for that. Um, I do encourage you to participate in that activity that he's done. It's been very important. And of course, Chico gave us a lot of insight as to how the new law will impact on the area of who was really the first to invent and was the invention actually taken away by someone else. And of course, these have all great practical issues. And then of course, David talked to us about the whole area of innovation and how innovation is going to be impacted by this new law. I was given the opportunity as someone who is extremely active over the last five years uh, in the area of patent reexamination uh, to work with the Senate staffers as an individual not representing any company or entity on this new law and, and came out in public saying that I thought that a lot of the new provisions that we now have will hurt innovation in this country and I take that position I still take that position, and let me tell you why. Um, as someone who is involved in 200 re-examinations, and probably 60% of those on the side of patent owners and the remaining on the side of third-party requesters, I can tell you that when you go to enforce your patents today, in court or at the International Trade Commission, it is a daunting task. It is a daunting task. And if you're in a university or a small company, or an individual, it's tough. I was involved in the Cornell case against HP. I was the re-exam lawyer for iFry against Microsoft. I was the re-exam lawyer for Uniloc against Microsoft. And so it's that perspective that, that helped me frame my perspective that it's tough to enforce your patents today in the US. And I've told this to Dave Kapos and I've told it to many others at the PTO that when they implement this legislation, they need to deal with the real world. And unfortunately, in the current re-exam system, the real world often gets lost. So let's go through it. So we've got a bunch of deadlines that we've been talking about today. I'm gonna to go into specific provisions. Uh, you, this uh, this, web, this uh, deck is available on the Stern-Kessler website and also on the re-exam center so you can get it anywhere you want. But let's go into uh, the substantial new question first. In order to get a re-examination going in, uh, an inter-parties re-examination going in the USPTO, you have to satisfy a threshold. It's called the substantial new question. There was a case from the Federal Circuit called In Ray Swanson uh, that dealt with this question. But the bottom line is, and the statistics show, that over 90% of all re-exams get instituted at the PTO. And the ones that don't, in my opinion, are the ones that are not well put together. If you do your job right and you do have real art that matters, you will get your re-exam instituted. In an effort to try to protect issued patents, which as we all know from the i Fry case, enjoy a high degree of respect in the federal courts under the clear and convincing evidence standard as it relates to prior art, the idea was that we need to raise the bar in getting re-exams instituted. And this is what this section of the new law attempted to do, section six. It attempted to raise the bar so existing patents would not be subjected to inter-parties review unless there was a real question that needed to be resolved. Because once you put a patent into inter-parties review, it's a game changer. It's an absolute game changer in terms of litigation and licensing. Very real issue. So you can say, well, who cares if, if we have too many re-exams? And the answer is patent owners care. And it stifles innovation, I would submit, because it makes it more expensive to get an adequate return on your invention if you're an innovator. So the new standard is set up here on the board and it attempts to raise the bar. We will see how the patent office actually deals with this in practice, not only in terms of their regulations, but in terms of how it's interpreted at the central re-examination unit and going forward at the PTAB. 
But my view is it's not going to make much of a difference. We'll still see most uh, inter-party re-exam requests instituted. So let's go to post-grant review. Now, as you know, in Europe, for example, we have the opposition system. It's a two-level system. It, it involves uh, a window of nine months where companies have to file for oppositions. And there is a very high degree of filing that occurs for oppositions because once you walk away from that nine-month window, you have to go into the individual courts of the countries involved. So it's a very financially attractive uh, move to, to go into opposition. And, and I think 30% of all the patents that issue in the EPO are put into opposition, at least initially. The U.S. has created what we call post-grant review, which exists for nine months after patents issue. And it is a very broad statute in terms of its impact on issued patents because you can, as, a, as an essential point, raise just about any defense that you could raise in district court or at the ITC relative to validity. So, for example, you can, you can challenge 101, which is statutory subject matter. Now, if you look at the recent cases from the Federal Circuit and the Board of Patent Appeals and Interferences on statutory subject matter. And we have a, what I think is the definitive article on this, on this subject uh, that's available on our website. And it's part of the Sedona Conference work that we do. You will see that it is very difficult to advise clients right now on what is statutory subject matter. And of course, we have a big Supreme Court case coming up uh, in the life sciences area. I believe it's going to be argued the 5th of December. And so the statutory subject matter area is huge. Now, under current reexamination practice, whether ex party or inter party, where you attack the issued patent throughout its life, you cannot raise issues other than patents and printed publications as the basis for your attack. And statutory subject matter issues are off limits unless you amend your claims. But the post-grant review will open up a floodgate of opportunity to challenge the statutory subject matter of recently issued patents. Now, I was the lead attorney for IBM in In Re Beauregard that produced the Beauregard-style claim format, which essentially allows one to protect computer functionality. Say, Say again? Yeah, allowed. And, and, it, and it resulted in the then solicitor, Nancy Link, pulling back the test case at the Federal Circuit and issuing guidelines. And then we have now seen the whole thing turn all the way around and Beauregard style claims appear to no longer be statutory. And there's a lot of question about other types of claim formats as to whether they are statutory. So I think that, and there was a comment in a recent case by our chief judge, uh, Rader, about this being a floodgate type situation. And I think that we're going to see post-grant review be the vehicle for a lot of this to occur. You can also raise 112 issues, which were not available uh, in prior, uh, in the current inter-parties a re-exam process. And this will become very important in a lot of the uh, biotech and non-predictable art areas, I would think. And then, of course, you have other types of prior art that go beyond patents and printed publications, such as the public use in China that Hal talked about, or other types of activities that would, you know, that we, we, ne we never saw before. So the big, the big question that I'm being asked by many, many of our clients and others is, are, are people going to actually use post-grant review? Or is this a statute that is going to take a long time for anyone to take advantage of it, which was the case when we instituted or we created inter-parties re-exams back in 1999. There was a very, very slow ramp up of usage. And, and what I'm being told by people like the people here on our panel and others who really have thought about this at, at, at length, and a lot of people really haven't, 
uh, is that post-grant review is probably going to be only embraced initially by the pharmaceutical and biotech industries. The electronics industries, particularly the big electronics companies that gave us this new law through their lobbyists, will probably not use this PGR, as we call it. So one of the other points, and I'm, I'm very cognizant of my time, is the reason that it will not be used is because of estoppels. Because these estoppels could be very significant and essentially remove from district court litigation or ITC litigation the, the ability to challenge the validity of the patent if you don't win in post-grant review. We are going in a way towards a German system where you test the validity of the patent in PGR and then you'd go to district court to deal with the issues of infringement, willfulness, and damages. There is limited discovery. This is uh, something that Chief Judge uh, Paul Michel has commented on a lot about how the Patent Office is going to be able to effectively deal with the discovery uh, for post-grant review. There is huge concern uh, in the user community as to how this is going to work. Another thing that's of grave concern and one that I have a particular uh, a lot of energy about is the hearing. If you go to opposition hearings, they can last for 12 to 18 hours. They go all day long. They start at 9 and they may go to midnight. What I'm re really worried about is because of the backlog that exists at the Board of Patent Appeals and Interferences, Chief Judge Smith says it's 24,000 cases. It would take every single member of the board uh, four and a half years to process everything that's currently uh, backlogged, he said it when he was talking recently. Uh, how is it that we are going to be able to have a full and fair hearing for the patent owner and the third party requester in these post-grant review proceedings, and frankly, in the inter-party review proceedings as well, because they'll both be heard by the same group. How are we going to get a real hearing, the one that really matters, so that the three judges can ask the questions and hear the evidence and consider the evidence like they do in an opposition or like they do in the district court. When you have interferences that have 20 minute hearings total based on a written record. And if the patent office falls for that and creates a system that is like interferences where you have 20 minutes in front of these judges, we have created a charade of a process. And the patent office must give adequate time to both sides for these hearings. Now, let's turn to inter-parties review. Inter-parties review is, as, as Hal said earlier, inter-party re-exam on steroids. And let's talk about why that is correct. Well, it's, only lim it's limited to patents and printed publications as we have for the current inter-party re-exam. That's correct. But in addition, uh, it has serious estoppel provisions that inter-parties re-exam has, but it has to be instituted within one year of an infringement suit being filed. Now, this is a really significant provision uh, that Joe Mittal, uh, the Senate staffer, uh, and I talked about a lot, is that in, in many of these re-exam uh, litigation concurrent situations that you see going on today everywhere, in the patent enforcement world. The re-exam is filed two, three, four years after the lawsuit is begun. And under this new system, if you're the accused infringer, you have to pull the trigger, as they say, within one year of being sued. And so, uh, you know, this is gonna put a much greater emphasis in district court litigation on the issue of validity than you currently see. Under the current district court rules, the defense team oftentimes doesn't really get their hands around validity until two or three years after the lawsuit is filed. What you're gonna see now is that because of this one year window, the defense side is going to have to come to grips with the validity 
uh, issues big time very soon. And you can't just file an inter-parties re-exam request by filing a form. You prepare a very large, detailed document that's got to be right, otherwise it gets bounced, and you're out. So the pressure on the accused infringer on the issue of validity is going to be much different than it is today under this new law. This is one of the most significant changes from a practical perspective, I think, that has occurred. And that's why the on steroids point, I think, is, is apt, because it's going to force the trial lawyers to deal with this. Now, one of the big questions that's come up is, who gets to do this stuff? Do you have to have a registration number? You know, one of the reasons I like talking with these two gentlemen is that they actually have registration numbers that are a little lower than mine, which is not the case anymore in most of the time I get to speak. I've got, these, I've got this ridiculously low number compared to most of the people in the room. So we have over 60,000 patent registration numbers currently. And those are the people that are going to be allowed to practice in this area. And I can tell you that the litigation bar that doesn't have numbers don't like this at all. And there's going to be a huge push, I predict, on the, on the side of the litigation bar to try to be allowed to do this work without a registration number. And I think that would be a big mistake for the patent system for the simple reason that the duty of disclosure attaches to the patent owner, for example, and Rule 1118 attaches to all participants in this process. No, so I don't, think, I don't think that we should have people doing this work who don't have registration numbers. Obviously, and for you. Now let's talk about discovery. This is an interesting slide because it compares the discovery uh, mechanisms that are available. In EPO, as we see in oppositions, if the witness shows up at the hearing, they can be cross-examined at both levels of the opposition process. In the new post-grant review, if you file 131 or 132 declarations, which you always do, which you always do if you know what you're doing in an inter-parties re-exam, the, the declarant or the affiant can now be uh, submitted to a deposition. This does not exist today. You are seeing 131s, but even more importantly, 132 declarations, which form the evidence, the record evidence of the case being submitted by technical experts, inventors, uh, commercial success declarants and others, all legitimate sources of information to deal with the issues at hand. <coughs> These declarations are being submitted and there's absolutely no way to take the uh, deposition of those, uh, of those declarants, those affiants. Now in the I fraud case uh, that went to the Supreme Court on the issue of clear and convincing evidence, I, I mentioned earlier I was handling the re-exam and one of the issues came up was we had the same technical expert in the district court case as we had in the, in the PTO re-exam. And now most of the time that's not the case. You have different technical experts. And what, what, what tried to happen from the Microsoft side was they tried to take the deposition of this technical expert about the re-exam process. So there's a lot of pressure in the litigation bar to get their hands on the people that are involved in the re-exam process. And this has actually become available now uh, through this change in the law. Now, let's take a look at the district court. As we all know, uh, the district court uh, discovery is very broad. And I was in uh, Nuremberg, Germany two days ago, and I was talking uh, to a group of European companies about discovery. I was actually using a very similar slide deck here uh, that companies in the hearing aid world and they of course view US discovery as completely out of control and over the top. Uh, the, you know, the, the US discovery process in Europe, for example, as you, we all know, is considered to be totally ridiculous. Now, pre-issuance pre submissions by third parties will be very interesting 
to see if anyone does this. It, it will be very interesting to see if, <coughs> if competitors or, or others uh, that are involved submit prior art uh, in the form of pat, uh, printed publications or, or, or other types of evidence to the patent examiners uh, while the application is pending during these time windows that are prescribed by this new law, or whether they'll just wait and deal with this issue in post-grant review or, or even in inter-parties review. And my, my, my guess is that, that this provision is, is not going to be used by the same group that's going to be using post-grant review, and it's also not going to be used by the same group that's going to be used using inter-parties review because uh, the problem is once this gets into the record, your ability to use this art later in these post-issuance proceedings goes way down. Way down, way down. In other words, if you use this, if you submit this art during the prosecution, your, your ability to use it later in this attack mode uh, once the patent issues could be much very limited if not extinguished. Right. Then what? Uh, they still file the submission? No. It's got to be during the prosecution. Yeah, it's got to be during the prosecution. I don't actually know how that's going to going to work if you don't publish your application. I, I don't know how that's going to work. Could you anonymously submit? Could you anonymously submit this? I don't know. I think it's going to be in the implementing. I mean, you can you can anonymously file ex parte reexams. I'm sure there's people in this room who've done it. I have a whole bunch of re-exams I'm up against, and I don't really know who's filed the re-exam against my client. So I, I would imagine, but again, we can hear from the PTO as to whether this can be done anonymously. Now, you, you raise an interesting point because, you know, whether the, whether the filing of that prior art actually create, removes the ability to use it later in, in a post-grant review. Okay. Okay. So, one. My 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 esteemed colleagues want me to shut up, and I'm sure they're not the only people in the and and the food. Right. Okay. So one quick quick thing. Uh, supplemental examination is a big deal for uh, patent owners uh, who are dealing with inequitable conduct, a very real issue. Uh, business methods. This section 18 is a quagmire if you have patents. And, and I would like to point out to the life sciences people in the room that you could easily have Section 18 invoked against one or more of your claims if you're dealing with your distribution, your diagnostic uh, methodologies, and other things. And this doesn't even get into the divided infringement arena, which is a, another big area that the Federal Circuit's wrestling with next month. As everyone else has done, I put up some uh, uh, articles that you can download either from the Stern Kessler website or from the Reexam Center website. A lot of this deals with the current reexamination process, but we also have some stuff there about what I'm talking about. And thank you very much.